Hello, good afternoon. As we discussed, we will shortly be starting the session on resource efficiency and circularity. So please do take your seats. If you have friends, colleagues outside, please encourage them to join us here. As you might by now know, my name is Kyu Bin Huang. I'm one of two global coordinators for the Children and Youth Major Group to UNEP. In my day job, I work as a consultant specializing in minerals and metals. So these discussions and those two draft resolutions we'll be discussing in this session are of a particular interest to me, and I hope to you as well. There have been a lot of discussions over the past few years on critical minerals and energy transition minerals, and we hope that these discussions this afternoon will shed some light on these environmental impacts and what UNEP is doing to combat them through the draft resolutions that have been tabled. Jody Natalia, do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure, I can go first. Hi, everyone. My name is Jody M. Wong. I am a policy analyst at the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics, focusing on sustainable finance and just transition. I am also a member of the UNEC Expert Group on Resource Management, which hosts the Resource Management Young Members Group, where we're exploring the topic already. And similarly to Jodian, I work with the expert group to UN Econo Economic Commission for Europe on resource management. Um, and I've particularly worked on the topics of sustainable consumption and production and super excited to be with he here with you today. Perfect. Thank you very much for joining us today. So as we discussed, the two resolu draft resolutions we'll be discussing today are class to the draft resolutions 16 on circularity, on circular economy, and 17 on minerals and metals. Um, Natalia, do you want to just run us through draft resolution 16 and what it means, what the key implications are, and the youth positions therein? Yeah, absolutely. Let me give a quick overview on the resolution focused on circularity. I think uh, we don't have too much time, so I won't be sharing my screen. Let me just uh, share a high level overview on some of the specific and discuss some of the specific policies. So first of all, the resolution sets up the issue of unsustainable resource consumption as largely or resource use as largely a problem of overconsumption. And overproduction, and I think that's a really strong part of the resolution, specifically the mention of the idea of sufficiency, so that there is a sufficient reason at which our basic needs are met, essentially, with a given level of resource use. And what's important about that is that it moves us, at least to some extent, away um, from just the issue of resource efficiency, but actually emphasizes that we need to reduce our consumption and production specifically to be able to ensure sustainability of resource use. Another topic that touches on or was a strength of the resolution is that it looks at the really whole life cycle of the product. That's really what circular economy is about, but oftentimes in policy, we see a particular focus on recycling, uh, which is just a really, really minor part of what circular economy should be about. So the focus on the whole life cycle, life cycle from extraction to processing, design, et cetera, and then consumption and disposal is really, really important. Uh, in that respect, it mentions some specific policies. For example, um, just to flag a few, extended producer responsibility, which really shifts the responsibility uh, for the disposal and management of resources from the end consumer um, to the producer. Another one is material passports, which improves the transparency and accountability of materials management across the supply chain, also mentions circular business models, et cetera. And I think another strength of the resolution is really that it mentions those, those policies specifically, rather talking about the concept, the concept of circular economy more broadly. Another key issue um, in the resolution is that it talks about uh, a broad review without just a very narrow focus on environmental aspects, but also on social and economic issues, including addressing inequality. Um, and that's really, really important here because the current uh, linear economic system does not just drive environmental destruction, it also drives increasing levels of inequality and inequity across the world, both within regions and between different areas of the world. So that's particularly important and the potential of circular economy here and alternatives economic, uh, alternative economic models more broadly is particularly important in that respect. Um, 
here it mentions so specifically the rights of waste pickers and marginalized communities, which I think is very important um, as well. I think these are some of the key concepts, but before I uh, stop, let me just mention a couple of caveats as well, because I, what I would want to highlight here is that while it mentions overconsumption and sufficiency, for example, the resolution doesn't necessarily tell us exactly how to get there, even though there are policies that we know, of. for example, material reduction targets, phase out, reducing specific sectors of, of the economy that are very resource heavy, but have little to no social benefit. This is something that for now is overlooked in the resolution, unfortunately, um, even though material uh, consumption targets in particular would be a strong policy with, for example, 65% floated for the EU. With the caveat here that this is something that should particularly be implemented in the global north, given that it is historically the global north in particular that has driven most of their material consumption as well as most of the emissions. Another issue here that I just want to highlight that the resolution lacks is a kind of a global view, as I just mentioned. For example, the EU makes up only 6% of the world's population, but consumes 25 to 30% of uh, materials produced globally. And that's really something that for now is overlooked. So when we talk about overconsumption, overproduction, it's really important that we talk about where exactly it happens. And finally, some issues, unfortunately, I missed in the resolution. For example, I believe that there is insufficient emphasis on reuse and repair in comparison to other, um, other solutions, emphasizing increasing the efficiency of resource use, as well as, for example, the issue of waste, which is, again, particularly important because what we see globally right now is that we have the extraction of resource happening in the global south and vast amount of the consumption happening in the global north, and then huge amount of waste, again, being disposed of in the global south. For example, the issue for the UK, where I'm currently based, uh, is that 60% of plastics are exported or the plastic waste. Um, so that's not a problem that's not really touched upon, even though there is mention of hazardous waste and illegal waste dumping, the issue really goes beyond that. So I think that's also really worth um, our attention, but I'll stop here for now. Thank you, thank you Natalia. So the two resolutions, the two draft resolutions have a lot of overlap in their scope, especially uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, reducing the well, increasing the efficiency and about the impacts on economic growth and you know decoupling our resource usage. Uh, Jody, what do you think are some of the key differences as well as the you know like specific points that are in draft resolution seventeen pertaining to the environmental aspects of minerals and metals? Thanks, Cuban. Um, so maybe just to start, what is the resol draft re resolution on the environmental impacts of metals and mining? It's firstly submitted by multiple countries, many of which are implicated in the extractive economy, and it recognizes a role of, re of minerals and metals in achieving sustainable development goals and addressing environmental challenges. So it really departs from the premise that metals and minerals are essential for achieving the 2030 agenda um, for sustainable development, but we need to manage it, manage the entire life cycle of it, touching on what Natalia mentioned earlier, in a sustainable way. Otherwise, we risk going into another ecological degradation that have brought us here in the first place. So there are a few things that in this resolution that is worth mentioning. It emphasizes um, the need for urgent action to strengthen environmental sustainability throughout the life cycle of minerals and metals. So from exploration extraction to the circular economy when it comes to reuse and recycle. Um, it also includes prevention, mitigation and compensation of adverse impacts on communities, especially communities in the global south and communities um, that are either next to or on indigenous lands. Um, so maybe a few things that are positive in the resolution that's worth mentioning. First is the inclusion of the rights of Indigenous peoples because of the disproportionate impacts of mining on Indigenous peoples. And that free prior informed consent, FPIC, is the first line of defense that allows Indigenous people sovereignty over their communities, lands, and territories. So we're happy that this is mentioned in the resolution, but more needs to be done to operationalize this, especially um, amongst corporations, mining corporations, and financial institutions. The second thing that's worth mentioning is the inclusion of deep sea mining 
and the precautionary principle, which is something that's highly contested, especially this year. Um, biodiversity loss linked to, to deep sea mining is in inevitable and likely irreversible. And it also can create social harms to multiple groups, in, especially ocean economies and coastal communities, many of which have a disproportionately high demographic of young people. So we really was, I was happy to see the mention of deep sea mining and are urging the UNEA to consider intergenerational and potential ecocidal consequences that are linked to deep sea mining in this resolution. The third thing is the establishment of an open-ended working group, which is to recognize um, expertise from different parts of the world, especially that of mining impacted communities, especially women and youth and indigenous peoples, trade unions and non-governmental organizations. And something that we recommended is that stakeholders should not be restricted to an observer status, but also but actually be incorporated as full members of the working group providing concrete input. Um, and the last thing that is worth mentioning um, in the in the draft resolution, but could go further, is um, the need for consistent and interoperable standards, guidance, and instruments. This is a topic that's gaining interest globally, and there's a lot of work that is being done on this topic, including at COP28, the launch of the UN Secretary General's working group on transforming the extractive industry for sustainable development. There are also a lot of standards and instruments being developed, but only if they're consistent and they're comparable can, can they really affect positive change because the regulatory discrepancy can actually end up further impacting the marginalized communities that I mentioned earlier. Now, in terms of what this resolution can really go further, there are three points. The first is, even though it's titled the environmental impacts of metals and mining, it really is fundamentally an issue of social justice. So we are urging um, that the resolution actually highlight the links between environmental rights and human rights, and the resolution should reference risks to human life, human rights, including child labor, and the rights to a clean and healthy environment for everyone. And the second thing, again, linked to the draft resolution on circular economy, which is arguably much broader, is that we need to have stronger language around value chain, value chain management. It is important to consider and lower primary primary extraction, but more so to do um, more with what we already have. So to consider material intensity, material efficiency, and the adoption of a circular economy. And the last thing to mention is around global tailings management. UNEP, the UN Environment Program, plays a really important role across initiatives that are tied to improving tailings management and avoiding environmental and social harms. The resolution can go further in terms of establishing a clear mandate for UNEP to um, continue to engage with member states and stakeholders in order to ensure appropriate stakeholder represent representation in these initiatives on tailings management. So all that is to say, quite a bit of overlap with the circular economy resolution, a lot of principle-based approaches that needs to be taken by a circular economy approach. Um, but the, the, re the draft resolution on metals and mining can do a lot more to emphasize the people dimension um, around resource management. Great. Thanks for that, Judy and Natalia. This is a question not just for the two panelists, but also for the audience as well. Do you think it's inevitable that the increasing the global population and global standards of living means that we have to use more resources? Or do we, as uh, the panelists have implied, do we need to have a more sufficient based model where we try to do more with less and ensure that no one loses out in the process? Yeah, from the floor, if you want to speak or take I, right up an on this, please feel free to unmute yourselves. Oh, hi. My, my name is Morris Ngaroya. Artistic name is um, Alisi Mundre. I'm an artist. And uh, I believe that even, even with the rising cost of living, we can be innovative around resource mobilization because um, circular economy, one of the pillars of the circular economy is localization. And what localization means is that with our small initiatives in our grassroots level, we need to understand how we can be able to mobilize resources within ourselves and within our communities. And that means 
what what is needed to be supported is a system of innovation we need also in the policy statement to include that um initiatives that are creating innovative models that are going to enable circular economy values in community um interventions to be able to be enabled for example i was here 2 years ago and uh, this was one of the challenges that we met we were with in the youth environment assembly 2 years ago where we have um innovations from the local from whatever country what whatever corner and they are all coming to all these big events in a in a bid to look for investors you know and so what we decided to do is to create for example in africa we do not have um a, a crowd a crowd funding um a, 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 an africa solution crowd funding model so we we created one called omoka.co.ke where even the kenya communities can be able to fundraise via the mpesa and also get in kind donations for the uh, uh, projects so such innovate innovations that can crop up among us or among the youth that are outside there they need to be supported in the policy paper so that we can be able to have this circular economy um dream come true otherwise when we just um come to these big meetings hoping that we are going to find big investors then that is not the dream of the circular economy and uh therefore even the other innovative approaches for example there is my fellow artist here mudoni they use their music to fundraise for their projects so it is possible that if we can anchor innovation and uh just i don't know how they you know there are there are good policy shapers around here who can put that point into context but i feel like uh, it is possible only if innovation is put into um consideration thank you thanks boris i think you've touched on a lot of uh, very interesting points there so the first i guess is the community aspect of it so in many countries they call it beneficiation so how you ensure that the resources extracted go back to local communities who are working at these mines and you know you have value add not just uh, offshore in mostly industrialized countries but also at the site where they're extracted but much of it in the global south and the second part of course is that of innovative financing which is linked to the previous one and how you ensure that people all stand to benefit in an equitable manner especially on an intergenerational level from what is being taken out of the ground and being utilized in the economy natalia yeah thanks given just wanted to comment on some of those points quickly i think um the member of the audience just raised a super important point about localization one more general point that i would want to raise is that the solutions regarding resource consumption production really have to be tailored to specific regions and that's particularly important because we see the levels of re uh, resource consumption vary very uh by region specifically uh to the point of localization i think if any solution is universal that is definitely one uh for example at generation climate europe we wrote a manifesto that focused specifically um on European youth and also run a large scale survey of the European youth to kind of look into those topics further. And we found very, very strong support for more, for building more locally focused economies. So in that sense, I think this is something that could be applied in both the global North and the global South uh, with obviously specific caveats for particular regions. But I think that's a really, really great solution. And it's great to see that mentioned. Um, however, just coming back briefly, briefly the point around tailored approaches, I think we should also recognize that not all consumption is necessary everywhere to the same extent. Um, so for example, when it comes to metals and minerals, one of the topics we're discussing today, uh, some of the consumptions could be avoided by, for example, phasing out things like single use vapes. Uh, we might not need them that much for the survival uh, uh, of, on our planet. So stuff like that are things that we perhaps can give up on for the sake of a better planet. But this also applies to things which are much, much more polluting than that. So for example, private jets, again, uh, used by a very, very, very small proportion of the population, but consume critical man metals and minerals that are very much important for the green transition. So I think we have 
take an approach that is tailored both by region, but also looking at specific product categories to understand really what we need going forward versus what is perhaps less necessary um, for us to build a sustainable and equitable economy. Thanks a lot, Natalia. Any more interventions from the floor? Can I? Yeah, um, please. Okay. My name is Agnes Dabluki Gothor. I'm a youth advisor for Chatham's House youth uh, group called the Common Futures Conversation. Chatham House is based in London, and my contribution is on humanitarian law and the environment. I recently finished my studies at um, Cambridge University on Sustainable Development Goals and International Law, and my contribution is having humanitarian policies in terms of mining for example, we can see what's happening in Congo. And I feel like the UNEP is really lagging in terms of ensuring that human lives are protected, especially in DRC Congo. I don't know if we have representatives from DRC Congo because I feel that um, the, the situation has escalated from an environmental crisis to a humanitarian crisis to a more to a climatic crisis right now. And um, this is what we're asking for capacity to be innovative as youth and having safe spaces for that innovation. For example, there's a young man in Palestine right now who has very good solutions, climate environment, environmental smart solutions, but they do not have the space, nor the peace, nor the capacity to exercise all this. So I'm asking for solutions to UNER6 to have more humanitarian approaches to environmental sustainability, and um, that's it. Perfect, thank you very much. And I think that's a point we've highlighted in our past interventions and in the major group's collated statement to this draft resolution, is that about the right to a healthy, safe and clean environment. So super important point and good to ensure that we understand that it's not just a matter of biodiversity or water pollution, it's also a matter of direct human health impacts that result in societal damages. Jody. Yeah, I also just to echo that that was a really good point made and perhaps something worth mentioning is in our formal submission to UNEP, we actually added a paragraph requesting the executive director to enhance international cooperation on promoting responsible sourcing and trade of these minerals and metals to combat conflict and the violation of human rights along the value chains. So your point is definitely heard. Um, and I think just to also emphasize the extent to which this is such a major issue for what for we're discussing here. Minerals and metals actually play a huge role in the economies of 81 countries that account for a quarter of the glo global GDP and half the world's population and nearly 70% of those living in extreme poverty. So like you've been said, this is not only a climate biodiversity issue, but it touches on well-being and economic development um, and security and human health. Thanks, Judy. And I think... Um, oh, sorry, Natalie, please go ahead. Uh, just to quickly build on that, I also agree that it was a really, really great point, um, especially considering that actually 50 to 80% of the metals and minerals that we need for the green transition are now in regions which are occupied by indigenous and marginalized groups. That's particularly important because their involvement in how we go about managing this, their re these resources is really, really crucial, as was mentioned. For example, in the example, uh, for example, in the context of Congo, where there have been a lot of human rights abuses that we're aware of. Well, how I want to link this to the resolution is that it does mention a lot of the right concepts. For example, as Jodian mentioned earlier, free prior and informed consent. But really, when it comes to policy, then more than perhaps a lot of other things, the devil is in the details or maybe more precisely in implementation, because, for example, when it comes to ethic, it's a very, very strong idea with, I would argue, revolutionary potential, but actually the way it's being implemented 
is doesn't often live up to that high standard that we're setting for it. For example, there was a very interesting recent Oxfam report that showed that of the companies that are implementing this policy, actually, it looked at 40 companies. And I believe, you know, a minority was referring to that concept specifically. I think it was 10 or so, but actually only two implemented independent auditing to verify how that process was being conducted. So the issue here is that we can use that approach and attempt to refer to it, but without independent verification and proper implementation, uh, we actually won't really be able to live up to the standard that we want to have for those policies. Um, and this is particularly important when it comes to the right to free prior informed consent, because oftentimes it's just some kind of coerced approval at the beginning of the extraction process rather than what it should be, which is like a really iterative process whereby we continuously engage with the given communities to not just ensure permission, but oftentimes permission with conditions or the right to say no, which might be even more important. So just highlighting really that operationalization of those clauses here is going to be particularly important and that we need more detail on how it's going to be implemented to make sure that uh, we really deliver on the ideas mentioned in the resolutions. Thanks. Just to follow up on that, I think the there are a lot of uh, really interesting parallels between AFPIC and what we call intergenerational equity. And it's about being embedded within the process from, you know, when we conceive of it to implementation, to design, and how we look at it on the ground and look at assessments as well. So, of course, you know, being an indigenous group and being youth, they are cross-cutting uh, groups, rights holder groups. And I think it's very important to understand that these groups have the rights and should have the right to say no at any time and to be in engaged in these processes at any point that they choose to um, take part in. And the other thing I think is interesting is that... Um, we, we keep sort of digressing from the point of environmental aspects of minerals and metals. And I think that's a good thing because part of the issue about the minerals and metals discussion is that we are essentially looking at you know, developed countries exporting their carbon emissions and in turn, developing countries are paying for it with land degradation, water pollution, and huge amounts of you know, pollution. And that is sort of reminiscent of many global North countries saying, oh, you know, we'll swap to EVs. But then they are still selling a ton of oil and gas to other countries who still need it. And, you know, there has to be some sort of life cycle analysis of not just carbon emissions, but also the land use uh, of water pollution and, you know, biodiversity loss. And I do wonder how we could make that happen at some scale. I see a hand up from Kavya. Do you want to take the floor? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um... So my name is Kavya. I'm just dialing in from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I'm currently doing my master's in public policy and I'm also interning at Tesla in the energy team. And in Australia, um, this is obviously a really big part of our economy and our sector. And we've, we've got a um, large indigenous population. And I just wanted to echo that a lot of the work that's being done in this issue locally really highlights FPIC as well as um, one of the key concepts. So it's great to see it in the resolution. Um, and then I would just like to echo another key term that we see a lot here is also the right to self-determination um, and giving local Indigenous communities the right to self-determine um, their approach to either their sovereignty or getting an equity stake in processes, but it's about capacity building um, within the local community so they can kind of take charge for how they kind of want to approach these kinds of increasing in mining of critical minerals and transition minerals. Perfect. Thanks very much for that. Excuse. Um, I, 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 I had, um, my name is Maurice Ngaroya once again, and I had a question. Um, as we talk about um, this talk of resource um, and, and finance and, and circular, and uh, I'm asking, in, in Africa, we are at a stage where we are developing. And now we have also developed states that have reached at a point that they have realized that um, um, they, they have reached that far, but there are things that they have done to the environment. What is the balance between the growth of the economies in Africa and the need to be environmental conscious? How can that balance reflect in, in, in resources? Because right now it is when the African states are discovering some of the minerals and with the high unemployment rate and everything, I think 
we need a discussion of how can that be made how can the growth of this economy be made possible without labeling this um, African states as rebels or people that do not are not environmental cautious. The other thing is that in the in the UNEP or in the UN system, we have foundations, we have we have people that come and pledge funds um, to help youth led initiatives. And uh, I ask myself, uh, if we look at the equation of the funds that are available for youth utilization for their initiatives in terms of percentage and um, the percentage of the funds that are um, catered for other categories of people, does it reflect our population? And the other question that I had is, is there enough education on resource utilization and even mobilization for youth-led initiatives? Because it is one thing to say there is an opportunity. It is another to research and see it, uh, there is an opportunity. And it, there, it is another issue for that opportunity to help that youth in terms of proper utilization. If those three factors can be, those three questions can be answered and be put in, in context, I think we can be able to um, have a more constructive Global Youth Environment Assembly. Thank you. Thanks, Boris. And yeah, again, very, very um, important points to raise. And I think we see a parallel in the energy space where we talk often about the energy trilemma. So that's affordability, sustainability, and um, what's the other one? Sustainability, affordability, and price, equity, I guess, and uh, security. So again, that touches on the economic aspect of these minerals, the potential for them to lift people out of poverty. And that's a really interesting point, I think, in a lot of these developing countries, because many of the people working in these sectors, especially the artisanal and small scale miners or ASM, they are able to make a good living out of these environmentally that damaging and you know very unhealthy occupations. That's not to say that it is a good thing. But in many cases, a lot of these developing countries are making the trade off for human lives, for economic growth. And that's the case with countries like Indonesia as well, which is projected to produce more than half the world's nickel. And that has led, um, you know, going back to Kavya's point about Australian projects, that's led to closures in multiple Australian projects, which are typically somewhat cleaner and less environmentally damaging than uh, Indonesian nickel projects. So I guess you know, a question I would pose to all of you is, if you're in charge of a company like Tesla and you had to buy these metals, would you pay more for environmentally sustainable options? Or would you want to make the cheapest possible product and sell more of it? Hello, can I add something? Good afternoon. My name is Isaiah Gon. Uh, I'm an informatist. Uh, I want to talk about uh, life on water, which uh, it's in Africa, it's actually getting messy if i can say because we find that most of our water bodies have uh have been you know they have a lot of impact on whatever on our health due to the waste that has been disposed maybe in the oceans and rivers but uh most importantly is uh those that depend on or in water to survive, that is the fish and other animals, uh, the aquatic uh, creatures. What what are the what are the bodies that or the UN bodies or associates that do uh, focus on the life? I mean, on life on uh, life in water that uh, will help. I mean, that do help in uh, developing or structuring the policies that do guide activities engaging. Because we can see most of uh, African, most of rivers, actually, I can talk of in Kenya, uh, are losing its, uh, they are losing its strength and uh, value due to destructions that maybe the, 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 the cutting of trees and, uh, and, uh, the 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 uh, what do we call what can I call it uh, 
the development projects that are uh, being focused around or close to the rivers. So what are uh, what are the policies that mitigate and what are the uh, unit bodies that do help in coming up with policies and even implementation of those policies? Because we can all attest that there are few of the policies that if you can read that have been implemented since its inception. So what are what bodies do focus on its uh, maintenance? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I take more responses from the floor, I just want to mention that in about half an hour, we will have a session here on chemicals, waste and pollution, where we will have a presentation by the Global Wastewater Initiative hosted at UNEP. So if you do want to hear a in-depth response to your points about water, uh, I would recommend you stay on for that, because these are the experts who are working on water pollution. Um, outside of that, any further responses from the floor? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kelvin. Can you speak into the mic, please? Okay, pardon me. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Kelvin, and I'm a student from Strathmore. And the first thing I'd want to do is answer your question about nickel sourcing. In my opinion, of which you asked us on our, on our opinion, in my opinion, I would otherwise want to uh, scale down on my production and source sustainably, and uh, and like sourcing through uh, vile means such as exploiting children and uh, exploiting the the small communities that are otherwise mining these uh, metals. Because uh, if, I, if I'm going to say people who are, who are trying to buy electric cars, albeit they're trying to be quote-unquote sustainable, they do not look at the environmental aspect of the, of the, of the sourcing, of the, uh, the, the pipeline at which... Uh, uh, the, the pipeline of the from from the nickel being sourced to when when they get the car from the dealer and uh apart from that there's something that really bothers me and it's one thing that i always wanted to stay on for the upcoming uh, con uh, con uh not contest, but discussion after this to talk about it is uh the way uh we as the quote unquote uh Maybe maybe less less uh, less rich less rich uh, of the of the society are uh, we're usually told to be more environmentally sustainable by like using uh, uh using maybe it's become a meme at this point about uh using uh this pl not plastic but paper straws and then them melting your milkshakes and all that it's a simple analogy but when you look at uh the world's quote unquote elite they they're not environmentally sustainable in any way, shape, or form. And as we're talking about efficient mineral use, uh, let's take a simple example of which I don't even, uh, it, it, it aff afflicted me in a, in a given way because I saw the, maybe the levels of uh, carbon dioxide are being released in the atmosphere. The, the past Super Bowl, Super Bowl, the people, people who watch NFL, really, I'm not into that really, but what I want to come to is there were 889 private jets 889 private jets. You can imagine carrying maybe one, three people inside there, someone in their small entourage. Instead of using sustainable and uh, far much more easier means to obtain, such as maybe using a public airline. And you can imagine the, the cost of uh, the environment is passed on to the not-so-elites of the world, while the elites continue living the kinds of life they, they otherwise choose to have, like even uh let me let me let me give another example but uh let me require just like two minutes or so to explain it is let's say when you are when you are when they're environmental uh uh, uh what's it called? like UNEA, the one that's coming up how many people will travel to kenya to the unep using uh private jets or uh maybe uh form, forms of transport that otherwise aren't so sustainable they don't look onto the they're coming here to talk about uh, sustainability, whereas them themselves are not particularly sustainable. Albeit they want to stay at a quote-unquote lavish lifestyle because of the positions they hold, they do not take account on to like the kinds of lives, uh, the kinds of uh, struggles they're passing on to the people who want to who the people they want to help by implementing those policies. And therefore, it would be my. Uh, my pleasure maybe to uh, advocate for 
uh, sustainable, sustainable means of transport for, such as uh, them. Uh, maybe I don't mean to say it in a bad way, but maybe let's say lowering your ego by by uh, using public forms of transport, like let's say commercial airlines, as compared to using uh, uh, unsustainable forms such as private jets for every single person that comes to a conference. And therefore, uh, if you could agree with me on this uh, and maybe pass it on to uh, your... Uh, your resolutions and and look into onto the onto the aspect that I'm trying to put out. It would uh, mean a lot to me. Thank you so much. Thanks. So first of all, I promise you, I didn't come here on a private chat. <laughs> um, and second, I think the point about the disproportionate cause and impact is really is really really interesting one to keep in mind. Um, and in economics, you'd call it the Pareto principle. 80% of the impacts are caused by 20% of causes. So like you said, private jets, things like unsustainable single-seater uh, EVs that weigh three tons with one ton of battery materials in them. These are not sustainable measures. Uh, Natalia, I think you're bursting to say something. Yeah, just um, a couple of points to a bunch of different thoughts that have been raised over the past 15 minutes or so. Uh, first of all, I want to just quickly come back to your Tesla question, because I feel like given you picked up something pretty important there, like if you're the CEO or management of Tesla, and I don't want to say that I am or that I understand their position exactly, and especially that we have someone from Tesla in the room, as we heard. Um, but if you were to be CEO of a big company, uh, I mean, what do you choose? Do you choose more profit or you are able to spend? spend uh to spend a bit less on the original resources and ensure more cars are bought or do you choose something else i mean i think what that shows is those decisions are perhaps not best left with private companies because their motivation is oftentimes profit in the end and that's exactly why governments and institutions should take responsibility for the green transition for example, currently huge amounts of subsidies are going still into fossil fuels, both directly as well as for consumption, especially in the global north. Um, through doing that as governments, we're disincentivizing green solutions for consumers. So that's a huge, huge problem that we should be addressing. And that way we can take some of the agency away from the private companies. Another thing that I wanted just to briefly mention is that you asked about solutions that can really be implemented at scale. And this links to a couple of comments that were raised earlier today, for example, around private jets and the small, small minority being responsible for the vast, vast amount of pollution and environmental degradation. There was also the question of balancing the issues of growth um, and resource extraction, especially in the African context, which I think one of the issues there especially is that many of the resources are actually managed by huge international corporations that just expropriate all the profit. And that actually doesn't particularly benefit growth in Africa. So that's another issue that we have. So what I'm getting at here is that a lot of those questions actually go to the point around the broader socioeconomic system that we're currently living in. And I think Especially given that we're here as young people, we can be a little bit more creative when it comes to the solutions that we consider. I think arguably that is the one thing that we can do, which is think more creatively about other generations, about solutions that are systemic, holistic, and can be implemented at scale. Some of those alternative models are, for example, a resource democracy in which resources are treated as common and their management is decided within a truly democratic structure rather than considered as financial commodities to be exploited for profit, which is exactly what drives some of the uh, poor decision-making nowadays in society. So just wanted to leave that thought and encourage all of us to think about those solutions a little bit outside of the box and consider systemic solutions rather than just individual policies. Thanks, Natalia. Jodian? I think just firstly to echo Natalia's point about this being a much more systemic issue um, that touches on the, the current system that we live in and um, especially the role of the public and the private institutions and play therein and we 100% need not forget and we need to actually do more advocacy in the policy sphere because it is the current subsidies and the public policy that are sending signals to the private actors and um, this is also an issue on a system level around short-term profit and value gain versus long-term value creation, which sits at the heart of intergenerational equity. Um, 
meaning that you know the needs and interests of future generations should not be jeopardized by the burdens of the past and our decision making today to the best of our abilities we should try and ensure that and the one thing that keeps coming up i think in this discussion as well as the role of finance and the role of financial institutions i what i didn't mention at the beginning of the panel is that i'm from canada and canada is home to 70% of the world's mining companies so there is a lot to unpack there as well with the role of canada in perpetuating a lot of the in, in inequalities and injustices globally um but there also comes to a point where we talk about the role of companies and financial institutions. Something that is worth mentioning is um, the, especially this year um, within the global financial system, we see a lot of companies and a lot of investors asking companies to issue what is called a transition plan. And it, and what that tells is asking you from your current where you're operating today to 2050 or much longer term, what are you going to do to align um, your operations, your activities, uh, your financing with net zero or with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And within that, there's a lot of scope for companies to think about targets um, and, their, and their operational financing and the way that they're engaging with companies in the value chain and they're engaging with policymakers um, and um, their governance structures to ensure that discussions around intergenerational equity can be embedded um, within their overall plans. But what that requires first is governments and policymakers to mandate such transition plans that companies need to issue and think about in the first place. Um, I'll stop there. I'd like to say something on that also. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Kenyan. Our president is a climate activist and uh, for that we have certain parks towards our NDCs as a country. So one of those regulations you asked, would you prefer a Tesla? So for me, how much will it cost me to import a Tesla? So for, I'm proposing tax regulations on climate smart innovative solutions. Uh, for example, importing a Tesla here, where are the charging points for these Teslas? Why will I not buy a Toyota and as opposed to Teslas? We don't have charging points in Nairobi. Even for electric bikes, it's um issue. It's just scarce. So the cost of, le of electricity, of charging, um, the cost of uh, putting up charging points, the cost of importing a Tesla. So those should be looked upon because... um. One of the studies on BCG, Boston Consulting Group, a study I was doing on climate and sustainability, most of these car companies are very, very quick to post their um, scope of emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three, in terms of how much emissions they're not producing as companies. But the same same companies are very big on wasting in terms of innovation. If anyone follows a girl called super fast car, blonde something, um, you'll see some of these companies, like I'm not gonna mention them, very big companies. One will um, use millions of dollars to, in, to produce a very innovative smart car that cannot go beyond five kilometers because of the terrain. It's too low. It's just a waste of money. It's like having a, a Picasso paint just to look at for the sake of it. Thanks. And I think just because of the scale of the industry, transport is one of the biggest sectors that we're talking about when it comes to minerals and metals. And as the gentleman who spoke previously mentioned, you know, there is a question here about sufficiency. We What we need is transport. We don't need cars specifically, right? And so that could take the form of public transport, which have far higher densities. And in this way, you re reduce resource consumption, even though you deliver more or equal services at, at, at the fundamental level. Any more comments, questions from the floor? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm yeah. Mohamed Swale from Kenya. I think the issue that we have in this the list uh, in these African countries is about the infrastructure, because if you compare Africa and also the and the West, where the West they have the infrastructure, they can put in place the maybe the the, the electric trains that you uh, that you are saying that can car carry a lot of people from one place to another to another point. But if you look at a country like Kenya. 
you have an issue when you, with infrastructure. For example, there are people are living in different areas in Nairobi and also in the metropolitan areas like in other counties near Nairobi. So it's a challenge to implement such issues, such, such things in, in Africa, but infrastructure should be given a priority so that you can achieve these goals of the climate change and also climate action. But generally speaking, we just we have, we have good ideas, good policies, but when you come to the ground, things are different. We need to relook at how we can assist African countries and also the least developed countries in the world so that we can move together in the same pace to achieve the climate action. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. I think there was one more person at the back. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Emmanuel Gishuru um, from the BMB Eco Group. So my question is about enforcement of these policies that probably are developed in the international conferences or at the local level. So how are you able to monitor how these policies are enforced at the group or implemented at the local level? So that is an issue that is to be discussed because yes, we will say hooray, we have developed the policy, the policy, but when it comes to the ground, they are not quite enforced as required. For example, uh, on assessment of development projects, yes, there are policies that regulate how development projects should be carried out on, or, had, or rather how they should not affect the environment that you are in, but when you go down to the ground level and try to see these development projects being developed, they do not meet the standards that are set up at the policy development stage. So is there a monitoring or a way to evaluate how the enforcement of the policies are, are, are being carried out at the ground level? Thank you. Thank you. Before I give the floor to the gentleman here, I just want to mention that one of the operating paragraphs of the draft resolution on minerals and metals calls for an open-ended expert groups that develops to, to, that further develops and prioritizes the non-prescriptive proposals. The NPPs are a set of policy solutions or like policy suggestions that came out of the regional and intergovernmental consultations held last year. And I fully agree that instead of just looking at the development and implementation, we should also be looking at monitoring as well. Uh, yes, please. Okay, I just wanted to echo what my the other brother said. Uh, even as we are here, uh, trying to make contribute, uh, making contributions and giving insights, we want to adopt the best policies. But where the problems come is that we don't have an implementation strategy, and from the policy formulation process and procedures or sector. Every policy that has been adopted, it must have uh, an implementation strategy to guide the same. So what I would like to remind ourselves, we are going to sit here today, tomorrow, and many years to come. Are we able to evaluate if the policies we are trying to lobby for, if they are working or not? If they are not working, then we need to get more other alternatives. Two, uh, looking at the cost of producing that car, electric car, and the cost to the environment, we need to have a balance because before even that, I mean the process of mining and getting the minerals needed for the manufacturing of the cars, it's quite expensive, one. Two, it pollutes. Three, it adds a lot to the emissions because there is what we call ecological rapsack. And this is the energy that is going to spend, or to be spent rather, to extract the minerals, transport them, and convert them into the products that we want to use. So my question is, and not even a question, but just a concern, we need to have a balance. Are we making losses or are we making profits? And how is it of value to our planet and our lives? Thank you. My name is Collins Lugongo from the Green Generation Initiative. Thanks, Collins. I'll give the floor to Judy. Yes, uh, two points. Um, many people mentioned 
the role of local communities. And earlier in the discussion, we talked about free prior informed consent or the processes that we need to engage with communities. But one thing that we haven't mentioned is grievance redressal mechanisms in the sense that if things go wrong, should things go wrong, if communities are impacted, what do we do retroactively to address those concerns? And that's a huge gap that's currently missing right now because every single company can say that they implemented to whatever extent free prior informed consent or that companies can say in their annual statement or on their website that they align with the UN guiding principles on human rights. But once that financing leaves the investors to go to the company and something and communities are displaced or re require resettlement in the process, there's not a lot of leverage or the companies are not held equally as accountable for those wrongdoings. And there are reports that see that development banks over the past six years that have grievance redress mechanisms in their operations did not take a single case or judge um, every single case that was brought to them as incredible or um, ineligible for, for grievances. So that is also a mechanism that we need to think more about in terms of its legitimacy, its accessibility, its transparency. Um, in the scheme of resource management and metals and minerals, but in all sectors that have um, acute impact on communities. And the second point that I want to make, um, we talked a lot about EVs and I think it's quite clear from the room that we agree that we cannot EV our way out of this environmental um, crisis. And the, the person who went right before me, I think touched on a really good point about kind of the sense of technological optimism that we currently have in terms of the solutions that is being offered. And it's the same thing that is being discussed with um, carbon capture utilization and storage technologies that fail to address um, the root cause of the crisis and both the circular economy resolution and the environmental impacts of metals and mining resolution come from the same cluster um, at this at UNEA six, which is the root cause of the climate crisis. So yes, while we're describe uh, while while we're discussing um, the the deployment of 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 technologies, accessibility of technologies, um, the technological gap within amongst countries and within communities within a country, which inevitably leads to social class and access issues. We also need to go back to the root cause of of the crisis in the first place and not solely rely on technologies to solve all the issues that we have. Thanks, Julie. I see a hand up from Hendry online. Yeah, please take the floor. We can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Am I audible? Give it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Sure. And also, I want to say, uh, expressing several points that related to uh, resource management, especially in, uh, in, in the ca 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 carbon capture and storage. That uh, I, I, I can see that uh, there are several uh, regulations uh, in several countries, which is uh, which is they are <clears throat> intended to seriously uh, take. Uh, seriously um, doing some of the doing to researching about about the resource management in terms of uh, metals and minerals and also in several uh, industries as well as uh, doing some of the carbon capture and storage which is uh, several uh, private sectors that only uh, already implemented the uh, carbon capture and storage uh, in several industries, uh, including in Indonesia. But uh, one of the se several things that I want to say that uh, there are still uh, several uh, several problems and also several uh, things that we need to improve, uh, especially on the uh, government regulations and also uh, and also the procedures and also processes that in the uh, in the in the upstream level, which is. Uh, some of the uh, uh, which is uh, the government also becoming one of the uh, pillars which is uh, determines the success uh, of the implementation of also resource management uh, therefore that there are several uh, uh, several uh, not uh, there are several uh, cases that 
uh, there are no uh, strong uh, there are no strong uh, regulations and also th th there are no strong controlling to uh, doing uh, to uh, to implementing resources uh, wisely uh, resource management wisely especially on the uh, carbon capture and storage so one of the uh, question is uh, how can uh, we are uh, in this <clears throat> in this forum to um, to uh, to uh, discussing and and also uh, several uh, solutions and also uh, several uh, pro solutions that we can be offered to uh, improving the resource management in the uh, carbon cap capture and storage. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andre. Okay, we are going to be wrapping up shortly. Are there any final concluding remarks? I see one hand up there. Right. Good afternoon. My name is Victor Okeo, and uh, I'm a writer with Climate Lens. Now, mine is more of an insight and a comment, let me say. Before these policies are implemented, there are feasibility studies and research that are done. And in most instances, you find that implementation occurs and uh, the communities that are affected by this are not usually informed on the effects that come from this in the long run. For example, currently in Kenya, I'm proud to say that we have got some of the largest solar farms in Africa. And uh, the world currently has not invested in uh, the recycling of solar panels, which means that in the next like 10 to 20 years, there's going to be an adverse effect on arable lands from the leaching effect that comes from this. I find a lot of households and uh, governments are implementing the transition to green energy, and yet they're not putting down mechanisms on how they'll be able to tackle this issue when it rises eventually from the effects that comes from this. Now, I only have, uh, there is a, a suggestion somewhat that I'd like to make. Earlier this morning, when we had a discussion on uh, when we had a discussion on uh, Mr. Mr. Rajab talked about uh, children's rights and all that, and we also had a discussion on how children can be included in formulation of policies. Now, the easiest way that you can get a child to understand what's going on is to teach them. Now, it would be better if uh, the curriculum across the world become informative in that children of a young age, as much as they're being told that climate change and all that is happening around the world, they need to know the effects of these other mitigation factors that we are putting in place. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, one final intervention. Okay, maybe just to comment on what my colleague has said. Yeah? Uh, because uh, we realize that uh, all the scientific measures that are usually put in place to solve anything in the world usually comes with uh, also some disadvantages. So even as we look at the risks, okay, the, 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 the negative side of all these in innovations, maybe it's high time now we started also engaging uh, people in the risk management spaces like insurance companies and all that so that they can be able to always advise us on each and every step that we take where is the risk where does the risk lie and how can they like come in and assist us with you know risk management mechanisms which can be able to help us in the long run so that we don't uh, uh, use a lot of resources to uh, to to solve a solution, then later again have to use more resources to now again uh, maybe uh, prevent the risks or rather curb the risks that have come with the solutions that we already dealt with. Yeah, so it was just to comment on what he said and yeah. Okay, maybe one or two like final final comments. Maybe in pink. Have one. Excuse me. Uh, I have a few concerns as well. Number one, uh, we have discussed a lot and we have given 
our questions, we have answered, we have given interventions, but there's something that I have not had maybe any of us talking about it. And this is about corruption. For example, we are here uh, trying to find solutions on how we can cut off pollution and all that. But how many industries are still polluting? Many of them, why? Because they are able to pay, they are able to give money and continue doing their pollution and nobody will ask them. Another question is, as an environmental planner, I believe that we have stages before development uh, is done. And I don't know where planners come in because most of the times when people are doing developments, you will find them developing in the wrong places. You will find them doing things without consulting because you gave out money. I have a very big issue with corruption and I am not very sure if we are going to, to eliminate all the issues that we have without really dealing with the, with corruption. Because if someone is able to give it, it means they're able to go ahead and continue doing their mistakes without question. Lastly, uh, I would say that we pass our new policies every now and then. And I wonder probably the processes that we go through when we are reviewing the policies. How many policies have we developed maybe 10 years ago? And many of uh, the, the policies which have been developed, we'll find that actions were not taken, but maybe after five years, you find we have new policies. When are we going to review and act, not only just pass new policies, but act on the policies that we gave long time ago and they, they were not acted upon? Because I believe it's most important to act on something instead of just advancing on the reviewing and giving the new parts of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, governance and transparency, hugely, hugely important. I would recommend you have a look at the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiatives, EITI. Uh, I think it's a great place to get started when it comes to learning about in enhancing transparency in the extractive sector. In the interest of time, we will not take further interventions, but we are open for coffee. So if you want to come and chat with me about minerals, metals, resources, I'm more than happy to do that. But let's first give a round of applause to Natalia and Jodianne for taking part. And thank you very much for being here. And the next session here is the chemicals, waste and pollution starting at 16.30 in 15 minutes time. Uh, on the other room at 16.30 as well, we have a session on intergenerational stewardship on financing environmental action. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Just wanted to say that I and Jodiane will both be in Nairobi next week, so hopefully looking forward to meeting many of you then. Thanks both. Bye. Thanks.